<laughs> thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank the organizing committee for letting me be here. I'm very happy to be here, this beautiful city. And um, uh, the question is, why should we talk about uh, Niguarda? Um, brain AVMs in Niguarda, because probably we have a little different approach to the treatment of brain AVMs uh, as far as uh, the general approach uh, in the world, which was a little bit um, uh, probably uh, original a few years ago, but now it's becoming more popular. Um, this is my disclaimer. So what what is the problem with brain AVMs? that it's much more complex than aneurysm because uh, they are very much different one from the other. We know little about their natural history, uh, especially because we group, them, we group them all together, but everyone is different, as we said before. They tend to become symptomatic at an early age. All patients also are different. Different is a young lady or an older man or a, a, a child. Uh, hemorrhage is not the only important endpoint. Uh, of course, we usually talk about uh, the fact that they will bleed sooner or later, but uh, an AVM can uh, prove to be uh, symptomatic or at least change your life even if uh, it does not hemorrhage. Uh, we have not found a consensus on the approach to the treatment, and, but most importantly, treatment has to be a cure. So the AVM has to disappear, no more. Uh, because for some people, just by treating AV, treat, the treatment of AVM may be uh, considered that you just reduce it in size, which is not, to my mind, any kind of uh, uh, real treatment. So we have to divide at least in two groups. One is hemorrhagic AVMs, the ones that come with the hemorrhage, and the other one is the non-hemorrhagic. So what do we do when uh, an AVM comes to Niguarda and with the bleed? We approach it as, a, as we would approach a ruptured aneurysm. So we tend to do a diagnostic CT or a, a, an angiogram uh, in order to find, to, to see if we can find the rupture point of the AVM. Why? Because if we find it, we want to occlude it as soon as possible, like a, a, a real aneurysm. If we do that, and if we uh, occlude the point that has ruptured, then we consider the AVM as a non-ruptured one. And that gives us more time. Uh, if uh, we don't find any rupture point, we consider surgery, immediate surgery, uh, of course, when the clinical conditions permit. What happens with non-hemorrhagic AVMs? Now, uh, the premise is that in Niguarda we are a team. So there is a neurosurgeon, a radiosurgeon, ourselves, and endovascular, and we always discuss about AVMs together, and we take a decision all together. It's important to have a good surgeon. That's a most important point, uh, who knows how to operate on AVMs. Um, so in a non-hemorrhagic AVM, we consider treatment only if we believe that we can reach a complete cure with a risk uh, uh, which should not exceed the 4 5%. For that reason, surgery is preferred because the result is fast and complete. You enter the operating room in the morning and by the evening everything is finished uh, and the AVM is no more there. Uh, in about 20% of cases, we perform targeted embolization to help surgery. Radio surgery comes as second choice in deep or eloquent locations. So what is the role of us of, as uh, interventional, neurointerventional people in endovascular in brain EVMs? To me and to us, the role of endovascular treatment is not to obtain a complete cure, but it's a help for surgery. Sometimes we do uh, obtain a complete cure, uh, 
but if you want to achieve it, most of the time, you just raise the risk of complication. And of course, as I said before, it may represent the first approach when we want to occlude the, the point of rupture. So why and how we arrive to this attitude? The neuroendovascular credo since the 1970s, when I started um, my job, uh, would be never leave an AVM to surgeons because surgeons are going to kill the, the patient. So we had to do something ourselves, whatever, to save the patients from the surgeon. Um, and of course, we wanted to occlude the AVM, and we went up with our catheters and uh, uh, perforated balloons and things you cannot imagine to inject glue and uh, to obtain a final and complete cure of the VM. But we had a hard time to obtain a complete cure of the VM. When Onyx came, and that was at the beginning of the 2000 and a little bit later, uh, it was an immediate success because uh, it was easier to use, there was no hurry, no catheters glued. Uh, you had this liquid thing that would really go everywhere inside the nidus. So we were really happy because we could finally stay in one place and fill the entire nidus of the AVM. So we believed uh, that our occlusion rates would come much higher and our complication rates would come much lower. Uh, one of the first cases we did was this young lady who had this AVM in the frontal region here. And this is the AVM on angiogram. And we filled completely the nidus with a one-year follow-up, which was absolutely perfect. So cases like this pushed us more and more to try to get complete cure of AVMs with endovascular treatment. But I did not show you exactly everything of that case because the CT scan that we had the immediately after that case showed a little bit of hemorrhage around the nidus. The lady was okay, she just had some headaches, but we could see a little bit of hemorrhage. So when I said that we thought that our complication rates would become much lower, did that really become much lower? In other cases, we had hemorrhages, 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 hemorrhages. So we had a lot of hemorrhages, more than you would really like. So after a while, it was time to look at our results, and that happened after four years of treatment. We had treated 101 patients, 62 patients with onyx, and in 62 patients we had 22 hemorrhages. Four were because of the perforation of the wire, four were due to the retrieval of the catheter, which would give subarachnoid hemorrhages usually. One was due to a hemorrhage in the follow-up, but 13 were due to uh, the procedure itself, and they were intraventricular and intraparenchymal hemorrhages, and that's a 21% of complication due just to the treatment itself. For example, this man with this AVM, we filled it with onyx, there was a little bit of residual left, and uh, the CT immediately post didn't show anything. The following day, we had a hemorrhage. Another lady, she wa had been embolized many times in 1998. She came back, new hemorrhage. This was the AVM. This was at the end of our uh, procedure with just a little tiny bit left and a hemorrhage. Another man with this AVM, we filled it with onyx. After the third session, almost nothing left. The CT scan immediately after was perfect. One week later, a hemorrhage. So this number was too high. 
also because the complications, the clinical effect of these hemorrhages were bad. Two major complications, four severe complications, and two mild complications. Uh, so we had, you know, a, a lot of severe complications. So our conclusion in 2009 was that, yes, this material is wonderful. It, you really get to occlude a lot of things, but we have increased risks. Because why, where are the limits of what we do? Even if you inject correctly and you keep on injecting neonics, it goes really everywhere. And you start feeling all the arteries, also vessels which are not involved, usually the onyx that you see is bigger than the original AVM. And we don't really control the venous filling because at the end everything is black and you don't see where it's going. So we have doubts if, uh, have we occluded the whole nidus? What is the real nidus? What are the limits of the nidus? Are we occluding the veins? What, what are we occluding good and what are we occluding bad? So there is a minimal control of everything, and especially on, on the catheter retrieval, even if uh, with time we had the detaching tip catheters, which helped a lot. But at the same time, in the late 90s, we started to understand a little better what happens with AVMs that bleed. Uh, a case of a young lady, this is the first case where we uh, decided we should do something specific. This lady had three hemorrhages, one after the another, and finally she came to our hospital. This is the uh, mm, angiogram, and we didn't really see where the hemorrhage came from, and maybe you don't see it either, until with an AVM, which is up here, you do the veterovasilar injection and you see the little tiny pseudo aneurysm, which is the point of rupture. And it's a point of rupture which comes from an anterior choroidal artery in the, in the subependymal location. So it's a false aneurysm, and we went up the anterior choroidal artery up to the point where we could inject first some dye and then the glue and finally occlude that pseudoaneurysm. So this was a case where we started to understand that maybe we could target our embolization just to the point of rupture and uh, save the possibility of repeated hemorrhages. And you see where the pseudoaneurysm was, just in the middle of the uh, ventricle. In other case, but we have many of these, with the intraventricular hemorrhage, and you see the AVM, tiny AVM, and where is the point of rupture? You do a super selective and you see it there, up here. And you reach it as, as far as you can and finally inject glue and, and it disappears before and after. Um, so the efficacy of this approach, which is just to occlude the point of rupture of, the MV, of a bleeding AVM has to be proven. We think it, might, it, it makes sense. So once we have occluded that point and protected the patient, the, the AVM is no more a ruptured AVM. It goes back to an unruptured AVM. So I told you that what we do today is to favor surgery. But how do we help surgery? Of course, you have to ask the surgeons, what would you like us to do for you? And usually, uh, he would ask you to occlude that part of the vessels which come from the other side uh, rel relative from where he comes from. So I come from here, I want you to occlude what's behind, because everything which is here, I don't care. I can do it. Uh, it's what is behind that for me is a problem. Um, so usually these are the deep arterial supply or if either on the opposite side of the surgical approach or a very defined part of the nidus. So for example, in an AVM like this, like this, 
he doesn't care if you occlude that this part of the nidus, that part of the nidus, that part of the nidus, or the feeders. This is something he can do very well, very easily. He comes from there. What's more important for him is this part, which is on the opposite. He comes from here, and this part comes from this vessel. This is a very difficult vessel for him to uh, uh, approach. It's in bit deep in the, in the white matter. So this is where we should go. On the AP view, same thing. This is where we should go. So this is the uh, super selective um, embolization of that part, AP view. So finally, you see, this is what we did. And this is what's useful. Everything else is not useful. And it's only taking a risk of uh, getting complications. Another case, again, the surgeon comes from the back, and uh, this is the vessel which he has on the other side of his approach. So very simple embolization. You just go there, here, and occlude this vessel. It, it doesn't matter. You don't have to fill the nidus. Uh, he will take care of the nidus. You just have to occlude the entrance to the nidus. It's like for him to put a clip on, the, on, a, on a vessel, on an artery. So here, no more artery, and, and the surgeon goes, uh, surgery goes much easier. This case was brought to us from a different hospital where they had already embolized a big part of the VM, but a part which was not useful for the surgery. So they sent the patient to the surgeon, but nothing was really done for the surgeon. And you can see that probably this part, which is more important for him to be uh, controlled, like we did afterwards. Um, not only in the posterior cerebral artery, of course, we can, you can also help in other locations. For example, this AVM here, what is useful for the surgeon? Not anything, nothing that comes from here. But the problem is this lenticular striate that goes up into the um, white matter. So you just go up here into the lenticular striate, inject just you know glue, very easy, very quick, easy, low risk. Before you had it, after you don't have it, the surgeon comes from here. From here, he doesn't, he has no more the problem of something which comes from below from the white matter. So the conclusions are that if it is true that the surgical risk of brain EVMs is sufficiently low, so if surgery can achieve a complete cure of the AVM with a risk of maximum 5 to 6 percent, today I think there is no place for the endovascular so-called cure with, because the complete cure is infrequent in uh, Depending of uh, how honest people are, they, it could go from 10% to 50%, but it's never 100%, and the risks are too high. So today we focus the endovascular procedure on two different goals. The treatment of hemorrhagic AVMs in the acute period, where we want to occlude the point of rupture, and the occlusion of focal compartments of the AVM for surgery. Usually these are the deeper and more distant ones. Thank you very much. Voila. Voilà.